In this video, we're talking about martial arts organizations, why you might want to be involved with one, why I picked the one that I did, and what I hope to gain from it. Hey, what's up? I'm Ken. This is Kim Fu TV. Each week I release videos in the martial arts, philosophy, technique, training, that sort of thing. And if that's the kind of thing you're into, welcome. You found the right place. But first, if you're new here, welcome. Glad to have you. Make sure to hit that subscribe if these are the kind of videos that you like. Don't forget to hit that bell because YouTube doesn't always tell you when I release new videos. So hit that, set it to all, and let's jump into today's video. You probably already know from the title of this video, but I joined the World Combat Association here recently, both as an instructor and as my dojo, Casper Dojo. So let's talk about what that means. And first, maybe a short, brief history of who I am and what I do. And maybe if you guys are interested, we'll do a video on this more in depth. Do you want that? Drop it in the comments, let me know, and I'll shoot something. I started martial arts when I was was young, uh, pre-teen, probably. I don't actually remember exactly. My first long stint with karate was with Seo Shorinru. And I trained under Andy Finley, trained in Casper, Wyoming, and I'm still there, still training, actually leading the school that that I was taught in. My instructor still teaches the instructors, but he leaves the main stuff the to me these days. In addition to that, I'm trained in Tobosa's Kali Eskrima, and that is a, another lineage of martial arts that I carry. So I've got these two different things that I've stuck with for a really long time. And then a third thing, which is the WKKJO, specifically the Jiu Jitsu and Kabuto parts of that. Kyoshi Sherborn is my instructor's instructor when it comes to uh, Oro Sensei's Kabuto and the Jiu Jitsu. There's a couple different Jiu Jitsu lineages in there. Uh, and I'll save that for that other video if I end up doing that. So for a long time, I've been a member of both Seo Shoren Ru and the WKKJO, as well as Tobosa Kale Eskrima, though that's kind of handled a little differently. It's not, it's in a sense traditional and in a sense not the same. But so speaking specifically in karate, because this video is about the World Combat Association, and that is primarily a traditional martial arts karate kind of thing, not exclusive, but that's what I went to it for. So let's talk about why you might want to join a martial arts organization. Obviously, I'm, I'm a member of two, now a third one that has its own components to it. Why would I want to do that? Why am I adding this third one? What's this all about? Uh, let's talk about that. But first, let's talk about why you would want to join an organization to begin with. Maybe you already are in one or maybe you're not. So the thing about a martial arts organization is it, it's allowing for a larger governing body to be in place over a over ideally multiple schools. You know, when you have a single school, it's not necessary. It's and it's not always there. But when you have multiple schools, an organization tends to be a part of it to help kind of manage the structure of that and kind of impart things that are ideal about that system. Why they do the things that they do, how they do them, and in some cases it manages the idea of fee structures and all kinds of stuff. All of that kind of comes into play. But the main pieces are these five. So number one, joining a martial arts organization or being a part of a martial arts organization gives you the ability to expand your martial network. Now that could just be expanding you to the other schools in your environment. So now you're not just in your school, you are a member of an organization that includes your school and your sister schools as well. Depending on the organization, that might include schools that aren't sister schools to you, but now they are. They're part of the family through the organization, but not necessarily your exact school or under that exact lineage. You know, there are independent organizations that are much uh, for the lack of a better word, looser in how, how they're all knit together, whereas you have ones that are based on a particular school. Look at the two that I've been involved in for a number of years now, and you'll see. So Seo Shoren Ru and WKKJO, those are both organizations of themselves. So we'll use Seo Shoren Ru. That is an organization that includes Seo Shoren Ru schools. While there are some affiliations, it's primarily directed at schools that are following the Seo Shoren Ru lineage, teaching the Seo Shoren Ru curriculum, and all of that. So it's kind of bundled neatly together as that one art, just an organization of people that are practicing that art underneath Soke Housel. Same thing for WKKJO under Kyoshi Sherborne. That same idea of schools that are, are teaching that, that art passed to them through there, uh, not specifically schools that are doing other things. But number two, it allows you to expand your resources. Sometimes that can give you access to training material. Sometimes it can give you access to different types of communication things, different groups that allow you to, to communicate and, 
and learn and bounce ideas and that kind of stuff. These two are kind of in conjunction with each other. You've got the network of people and then the network of resources, and usually those go hand in hand. Another component to your resources might be things like events and seminars that are now available to you as part of your organization. Maybe they are exclusive to your organization or your access to them is, is made easier because of your organization. And then third, now you'll notice these are all kind of tie together. Third is building more relationships. So it allows you to build relationships with the people in your organization who, who maybe are above you if you want to consider it in that way, where you've got the people here who have taught these people who have taught these people and, you know, this person taught these people who have opened these schools, who have taught these people, whatever, but also allows you to build relationships with the people who are in those schools, other students, you know, students of your instructor who maybe have, have gone on, students of other instructors who maybe were contemporaries with your instructor, or people that, that you don't even have that direct connection to, but now you do, because you have that common bond of the organization, and it's building a way for you to get in, get in touch with each other and, and build that relationship. Number four, rank recognition. So if you're moving from one school to another and you're doing that within your organization, then your rank can transfer. Sometimes it depends on the organization, but if you are, so say in Seosho and Ru, if under Seosho and Ru, they recognize my rank as what it is, and then I go move to another school, provided that school is within our organization and, and is following the same things, then it's likely that my rank will continue to be the same. More on that later. But so through that, you have that rank recognition. So one, there's a body outside of just your instructor who, who is recognizing that you have the rank that you have. And then two, you have the ability for that rank to transfer with you potentially to other schools if you have to move for work or, or for school or whatever it is that has you moving around. And then last is sometimes there's member benefits. Sometimes organizations will have a benefit where you might get, say, discounts on things like the events and seminars that you're organization puts on. You might also get some sort of discount to retail places or wholesale places or things like that that you have access to because of your organization that gets you discounts on actual merchandise or equipment or things like that that you need to run your school and, and do what you do. But then it also can include things like insurance and might give you good deals on insurance because your organization has set up with an insurance company to be able to get lower premiums and that sort of thing provided to you because you're not filing as yourself, you're filing as part of a larger group. That's probably one of the bigger benefits of an organization directly when that's available is the idea of when an entire organization is applying for insurance, they can get a much lower premium and better benefits, things like that because there's so many people. Whereas if you're joining your school of 10 people, your premiums might be higher and, and your options might be more limited just because of that. Now, I'm no insurance person. I encourage you to pay attention to that and talk to people you know and trust who, who can answer more questions about things like that. But like any other discount and things like that, the more people are involved in it, the easier it is to allow for that discount to take place. That's not available at, in every organization. So if that's something that you're specifically looking for, make sure that you pay attention to whether or not it's included. It's not automatic. Just because you join an organization doesn't mean there's some insurance component available to you. So obviously read what you're getting into. So why did I want to join the WCA? Why the World Combat Association specifically? And I've already said that I've got two other organization affiliations for myself. Why would I want to go in and create this additional thing? So in a way, I'm going to take a step back. So in the last couple of years, I've been following a man named Ian Abernethy, who kind of opened my eyes to some different parts of the martial arts, and specifically karate and its application and its history and things that make sense, things that have been nagging at me for a long time, but he spoke about them. And that kind of started a change for me. It, it kind of helped drive me the direction I was already going, but it really kind of helped dial that into focus. Through being exposed to Ian Abernathy, I started becoming aware of other people, Chris Wilder, Peter Constantine, different, different people who are kind of within that sphere that are doing the same thing he's doing or similar things, and they're all kind of heading this direction together. They're kind of forging this path or continuing it. Maybe they're kind of picking it up. You know, so, and I dove in whole hog. Ian Abernathy has an amazing podcast. I encourage you to go listen to it. He did one a month for, for like 10 years, and I've listened to all of them. He's done many videos on Bunkai. He's had interviews with a lot of different people and talked to different people and pointed me towards different people. So while I mentioned Ian Abernathy, and I'm very thankful for what he's done, one of the things that he's done that's been very valuable to me is the ability to, to introduce me to other people that are thinking 
like us. And I say us because the reason that I gravitated to Abernathy to begin with is the fact that that I'm headed the same direction. In that old context of Sensei, that person who's gone before, he's further down the path that I'm trying to go. So, so by becoming aware of him, he gave me the great gift of, of also pointing to other people who could can help continue that and have started building this network of people who who help and have the same direction. And I'm, I'm going to get into more of that in just a moment. So anyway, during those podcasts, I became aware of the British Combat Association. In the UK, they've got the British Combat Association. British Combat Association is a group of people with a pragmatic focus, looking for things that are practical and, and co- collecting like-minded individuals to, to build and forge forward on this idea of practical karate. Through that, they're able to do things like offer insurance and, and seminars and events and connect people and, and do all of this kind of stuff, which is really great. But that was limited to the UK. So the World Combat Association came later. And so when it came around, their goal was to take the things that they had going with the British Combat Association and, and then feed the baby birds that were asking for this to exist outside of the UK. And so they did which is really, really great. Now, things like the insurance component, I kind of mentioned that you have to pay attention to that. The insurance component's not included because while they were able to do that through the UK, at least at this point, they're not able to do it through at a global scale or that sort of thing. So it's not there, but it wasn't what drew me to it. So that's okay. But other than that, I mean, there's not a ton of differences between the BCA and the WCA because they're built by the same people with the same focus. So why did I choose the WCA over the BCA? I live in the United States. I live in Wyoming, so I don't have the option to do that. So when the the WCA, when I found out that that was available, that became very interesting to me. I already have organizations that I belong to. I belong to those organizations because my lineage is there. Because there's a level of loyalty there. I wouldn't be where I am without the people involved in those organizations, especially towards the top. So in both of those situations, there's there's the head of that organization and, and my instructor is is below that person directly, you know, and then to me. So so in a sense, by staying connected to those organizations, it's so that I can can continue to show loyalty to my instructor, who's very, very valuable to me. The things that he's given me are very important, and I would I would absolutely not be here without them. I'm still very active in the WKKJO side, though Seo Shoren Ru, maybe not as much. And it's just because I wasn't quite in alignment with the direction I felt like it was going. I didn't feel like we were very connected as, as an organization, and, and part of that, of course, is on me, but it's difficult. Uh, it felt very separate. It didn't feel very connected. And so it became hard for me to want to continue that at a school level for all of my students who didn't really have a connection to these, to these other people. I had had an opportunity because of where those people were located while I was training. It was easy for me to travel to them, but they've since moved. And so I think all of my student base now has no idea who these people are outside of when I speak about them. And, you know, I I just didn't feel like that had the same value for the students. So I kept that for myself. So I can maintain that connection because it is a part of my history um, and it is a way of me me showing respect and loyalty to the fact that that's at least partially where I came from. But I need to look at what's available for my students. When I originally thought about this, I went, I don't think an organization is necessary. And that's where my part fits in is I don't, I don't truly in some ways, I don't truly believe in organizations as, as being necessary. If you want to learn the martial arts, you need an instructor. An instructor inside of a school may be unique even inside of that school. That school may be unique even inside of its organization. That organization may be unique inside of the scope of its organization. You know, that family of schools may be unique inside of the, the, the scope of the organization. So because of that, I feel you have a relationship with your instructor. And, and at the end of the day, what you are gaining, the knowledge that you are gaining, the skill that you are developing is yours. This gets into something entirely different, but I, but I think about the fact that you're developing that. You're taking what your teacher's giving you and then you're teaching it to yourself, right? You have to process that and analyze it and ingest it. And then it becomes what it is. So while that person is very important, at the end of the day, your skill is yours. You will always be 
you. And you'll never be a carbon copy of somebody else. It's just not the way that it goes. If you're spending too much time trying to become a carbon copy, I would argue maybe you're not even in the right place. But so there's that relationship. So the students that I'm teaching are getting what they get from me because they want to get it from me. They believe in what the school's doing. They believe in my instructor. They believe in all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, they're studying under me because I had something that they wanted to get. They, they wanted something from that relationship. So we've built this relationship and we've continued to train. At the end of the day, and this is where it comes back to those ranks and that sort of thing, is if the people that you're talking to have no idea who I am, they're going to have a hard time really caring about what I thought your rank should be. And so I'll throw it in the card up here in description below, uh, a link to a video where I kind of talk about my ideas of ranks and that kind of thing, which really fits in this scope. But maybe some different thoughts that I've had recently are included in this. This is kind of a follow-up to that. So at the end of the day, when you go and have that rank recognized by the organization, not everybody in the organization is following the path that you are or that your instructors are, that you, your school is. So there's a level of discrepancy in what that rank truly means. So even though you might carry it in, it might still need to be adjusted and tuned to match what's happening in that school, which is absolutely fine in what should happen. In, in my own school, I don't carry rank in. And that happens for two reasons. One, we don't wear colored rank. So as far as a belt, that's not going to happen anyway because, because you're going to wear a white belt until you wear a black belt. And you're not going to wear a black belt in my school until your black belt reflects my school. You know, and that's not a slight against anybody who has a black belt who comes into my school because I believe that they earned that. It's theirs. But from the standpoint of other students in the building, when they look around and they see that belt, that means to them, you know what I need to know. And if your black belt came from something that doesn't include the things that you're trying to learn, that could be really misleading. So I don't, I don't even mess with that. I believe a humble nature and humility are really important components of a martial artist. And if you can't get around that, if that belt is so important to you that you've decided to train in this school, but you won't train unless you can wear your belt, then my school is not the school for you. If you've decided you want to train in this school because there's something here for you, you're probably going to be fine being like, yeah, I'm good. I don't need to wear that in order to get what I'm trying to get. You know, you're, a belt is a belt. And it's easy to tie ego to it. And it becomes the thing that, that some people go so far as to use that belt to show people this is who I am. And it's, it's not. It's a reflection of somebody's assessment of what they thought your skill level was. But even then, that skill level, it's not, it's not who you are. And, you know, your ability to throw a punch or hit somebody or knock somebody out, I don't really want to be measured by that. Uh, because that's not a thing that I do all the time. I want to be measured by my character and, and who I am and how I build relationships with people and my skill. I want that to be secondary. You might choose to come to me because I have a skill that you want to learn, and hopefully I can provide that to you, but I don't need that to be at the forefront of what we're doing. Because at the end of the day, if you and I can't stand to be in the room with each other, if you can't stand to be in the room with me, I'm not the right person to teach you. So that sets aside. And then second, kind of ties into that first, is, is in any level of rank, that is recognized by me in my school, I want that rank to reflect what somebody else in the school can expect you to know inside the scope of the school. So if I've got certain criteria for you to be a fifth Q and I've got an eighth Q who's talking to you, trying to get knowledge about what they need to do to continue forward or to answer some questions about how we do what we do, I don't want that to be confusing. I want that rank to reflect that you carry knowledge of the way we do things. And that's not an ego thing. That's not about our way is the best way and you should follow that. It's just about if you're in the school, the way that you're going to progress and move forward is to do things the way that we do them. And you chose the school for a reason. So to, to be in there and then be getting information from somebody who comes at it at a completely different angle is still working through it themselves. It can be really confusing, can lead to frustration. It's just easier to just set that aside and usually people who carry rank, rank faster, right? They catch up to their rank quickly. So, so I don't find it to be that big of a deal. If you have good skill and all you need to do is kind of learn 
what our curriculum is and how we approach things and what our philosophies are, then that should happen a lot faster for you than somebody who has no background whatsoever. And so you'll catch up quickly and pretty soon you'll be back to the rank that you, that you were before as it stands anyway. And I think that's an appropriate way to handle it. It's not the only way to handle it. It's not the only way it has to be handled. But it's the way that I've chosen to handle it. So what I found in Ian Abernathy and what I found in the practical karate focus and what I found in the people in that sphere that are moving towards that goal is what I was looking for. I was never looking for competition. I was never looking for a competitive skill set. I was never looking for those things. I, I wanted health. I wanted mental health. I wanted physical health. I wanted an understanding of the body, but I wanted the context to be defense of self, defense of people you care about. That was really important to me. And so that's where I always wanted that direction to go. There were times where I felt like the way we went, and I say we as in the people that I trained with, the, the way that we went, I, I felt like it was on track with that. And there were times that I really didn't feel, I felt like there were pieces that could be pulled away and and they were not necessary to follow that path. So as I took over the school and continued to focus, I continued to head that direction. And as I discovered Ian's material and the people around him that he referenced, I came to find that I knew that what I was looking for was here. The things, the research that I had done, the books that I had read, the, the testing and stuff that I have done to challenge myself was reflected in what was being shown there. And as I came to understand that it was difficult for me because there was a challenge of, am I being disrespectful? And I still struggle with that. Because to, to branch off from what got me where I am, to me that feels disrespectful. I just also feel strongly enough about it that I'm doing it anyway. And I have to live with whatever those consequences look like. And, and, and so far, there aren't any. I've had lots of, inst of conversations with my instructor, who is the person whose, whose opinion matters the most in this situation to me. And we're on the same track. And what I noticed when I looked through the material of the practical stuff is that it was in there. He was including things that I felt like were off track because that was what was taught to him. And these are my assessments. These are not things that he's necessarily told me, but, but what I track on is the fact that I feel like those were things that were taught to him that he passed on because they were part of what was supposed to be passed on. But then there were nuggets that were contained when we would train that matched. They locked in, they fit perfectly to what I'm talking about, what I was looking for, what I believe in my heart to be true in how this stuff is applied and what it's used for and what its function is and how you need to approach it and the philosophy behind it. I just wanted to get rid of the, the other stuff. I just didn't want to spend time on it. I only have so much time. You know, I've, I've talked at, at length about that so video and link in the description on another one talking about the commodity that you have, which is your time and how you focus it is really critical to what you get out of the time you spend and the training that you do. So I really wanted to cull away from the parts that were moving away from where I wanted to go and double down on the things that were headed the right direction. I'm not looking to hugely expand. I don't feel like I'm lacking a lot in that area because I did get those things from my instructor. I just want to spend more time on them and less time on things that don't fit. Not that they don't matter, not that they're not important, not that they're not useful. They just don't fit the direction I'm going. So here I am in this position where I, where I have, I've gained what I've gained from my instructor that matches what I want. And I've gained things that I feel like were passed to me because they needed to be passed to me. But that left me feeling like I didn't want to necessarily pass those on. And that's my decision. Uh, and it's a difficult one. You know, you got advice for that. Hit that down below. I'd love to hear about it. Because this is a challenge. It is difficult to think about that. So what, why did I choose the WCA? The first was the pragmatic focus. The WCA, that is the goal, is collecting like-minded people about the pragmatic focus, the practical application, the things that make it, you know, not focusing on the history of it um, for history's sake. The history is there, but that's, if they were to discover that what was there historically, you know, that's another thing that Ian Abernathy said is he's like, I'm not a historian, I'm a pragmatist. I'm not looking to to keep what was historically accurate if I find that that we've discovered since then something that is more applicable or more appropriate or just fits better because the world has changed, then why keep the historical one when the old masters would have wanted us to continue forward and use what was applicable 
approach it practically, and I believe that wholeheartedly. So I'm not looking to keep things preserved in amber so that they can be preserved in amber. That's There's no use for that. And if if the skills that I'm developing are really good at dealing with things that were at a certain point in time but are not in my point in time, are they really that valuable to me? Especially from a large slice of the pie situation? And so instead, focusing on what's there. So keeping the history of it, but even trying to be more accurate to the history of it. Obviously a loaded statement, but not for this video. And getting rid of anything that had a competitive focus to it. There were parts of what we did that, that the mindset was, I'm not doing this to gain a competitive skill. But it was still a competitive skill. And that always was difficult for me. I got good at doing those things, but I didn't, I, I could easily get rid of them and I don't want to keep them. I don't, it's not for me. I, other people will be really good at teaching that and they'll be better at teaching it because it's what's interesting to them. It's what they want. So I'm not the right person to do that. So that pragmatic focus is exactly, and it's number one on this list because it's the reason. These other things support that reason, but it's the reason. Number two is the apolitical atmosphere. They're, they strive to go, let's all get together and focus this way. I don't care if you're Taekwondo. I don't care if you're if you're Karate or you're whatever. You know, we're, we're just trying to get to practical martial arts. And we want to help and develop and build and, and move that direction regardless of other things around it. You know, I don't care about your belt system because because your belt system is secondary to the goal. And I don't care about who has what status or whatever. And I believe in that. I, I think that that stuff gets in the way a lot. So get rid of it. And it and it's not gone, you know, but the goal is that they've built an environment that has a really good focus and it, it kind of naturally gains the people who match that focus and maybe naturally loses the people who don't have that focus. And that's perfect. So that's great. That's a great thing. It's not why I'm there but it's a great thing. And so back to the history, historical research, not historical for preserving an amber, like we mentioned, but historical of, okay, there was a period of time, and there's some really great material about this, about how there's a period of time where things were taught in universities, things like that, and things changed, and we could go and call that historical, but it itself was not historical to the things before it. And that doesn't matter in a way, in a sense, it really doesn't matter that that is the case. What matters to me is the fact that the stuff that was done prior to that is what I'm looking for. Not because it was done prior to that, but because it is practical and applicable and it fits what I think is appropriate. So I want to move past that and focus on history's history and, and dive into that stuff. And, that, and you get into Ian Abernathy, Patrick McCarthy, uh, Peter Constantine, all these different people who are putting energy into doing that, and it's beautiful. So huge connection to those resources is exactly what I'm looking for. You know, I, I want to continue to follow that, and I want to see that happen. They're going to continue doing it whether I'm there or not. I'm sure they are absolutely thrilled that I'm getting involved, I'm getting our school involved, and we're doing all of this stuff. I am also sure that they don't care, right? They're excited about it. They want it to happen. But if I weren't to do it, it's not going to stop them from doing what they're doing. So me joining is, is not my way of going, ooh, look at this. It's, it's my way of going, I want to come with. You guys are going on this journey and I want to go. I want to come with you. And one of the ways that I always look at this stuff is I want to look at how I can pass. I want to push as far as I can into this stuff and find what I believe to be true and appropriate and, and good for what my goals are, but I will never be done. So my goal is to leave my students in a place where they can pick up where I left off and keep moving forward. And I want to do that in the best way possible, and that's part of this stripping away of things that don't match that goal. So number four is global comfort. Now this one kind of sounds really weird, but you can think of it as, as that organization, family, and rank recognition, and all of those things. I have students that move away all the time. They, you know, I have students that are, are in grade school, high school, that sort of thing, and then they move on to university or they take on a job or they move for work or they have family, different things that move them away from our school. Well, I haven't always known what they're getting into when they get into some of the other schools from the other organizations that I'm in. But I know the goal of the WCA and I can feel more comfortable that a school that is a part of that is trying to go the direction that I'm trying to go. Will they teach like me? No. Will they teach what I teach? Probably not. Will they do things the way that I do? Absolutely not. 
But will they be headed the same direction? Will they be working that way? And will they be able to to integrate my student, hopefully, and continue them on that path, even though I'm not there to do that? Absolutely. They don't need to get what I have. They don't need that. They need to continue that goal. If they're getting from me, that's great. That gives me the ability to have that focus on being able to pass those things on to somebody to continue that goal. But I just want them to have it. And if it's what's interesting to them, I want them to pursue it. And so if I've, if I've got to have them move to another school, I want to be able to say, hey, this is comfortable. This is comfortable for me. This is a place that I feel fits because of this. I've got the ability through the organization to make contacts with people, talk to them. By then, I might even already have good, um, good rapport with them and back and forth. We might already have a relationship and I can say, hey, I've got a student moving over there and I, I want them to come by. Is that okay? And that's something that's really important to me. So that's one of the things that that drew me to doing this, to to looking beyond myself and joining an organization was to allow for that to happen, not for me, but for my students. And last is access to events. You know, I mentioned that as just part of any organization, access to events that are put on by people that are doing the things that I want to do, the things that I want to develop and research and understand and and continue to further my skill in. I'm going to be in the loop now. You know, I'm not saying I don't have access to them now. If I were to find one and, and go, I'm sure that I could get invited or or you know, pay the appropriate money to get there. And I don't even care if there's a discount for me being a member. Maybe there is, you know, and that might depend on the event and that sort of thing. I actually really don't care about that. I just want to be in the loop. I want my ear to the ground so that I can know when they're happening so that I can try to be involved with them. That's a huge deal for me. So access to those events in that way, in the idea of being aware of those events. Is, is one of the things that I wanted to gain. So speaking of wanting to gain, let's look at what I wanted to gain out of doing all of this. So first, I want guidance. I realize that I'm headed a direction. I know where I'm going and I feel like I can get there. And I can stumble and, and trip and, and figure it all out or I can work with people that are trying to get there too and we can support each other and they can give me guidance on how to get there or, or dealt with the same struggles or different things with the same goal. I can know that they have the same goal and I can get that guidance to help get us all there and together. And I think that that's a beautiful thing. That's the first thing that I want to get out of this. Number two are the resources. You know, people are shooting videos and, and there's documents and books and different things. Having access to that either through the organization, which there are, there are resources in the organization made available to members, but there is also just the knowledge of those resources. You know, the newsletters and stuff that come out of this organization are fantastic for helping get resources to you to be able to find and continue your training and your knowledge and your your understanding of things. So that was a huge one. And then I also wanted my exposure. And that can sound ego focused, but really I kind of it's kind of the opposite. I want to crush my ego. I want to expose myself kind of the way I am on this channel. I want to put myself out there with people that have those same goals that are striving for that thing. So that if I'm off base, I'm on the wrong track or things aren't there that that through that exposure, you know, you can't find when things aren't right unless you shine light on them. So I could fear that challenge and I could go hide in the dark so that so that I don't get challenged and I, and I just continue to live in my own ego-filled life. That's not what I want at all. So I make these YouTube videos. I, I have this channel and I want to put myself out there to these people, right? I can put myself out there to everybody and YouTube's kind of doing that. But there are plenty of people who I don't really care about their opinion. Maybe they're coming at it from somewhere that has nothing to do. You know, if the world's best athlete was telling me they don't like the way that I protect myself, I'd be really interested to know what their background in self-protection is. I don't care how good you are at the athletic thing if it's not compatible with what I'm trying to do. So I want to put myself in front of people who are trying to do what I'm trying to do and let them show me where I'm going wrong. Let them see what I'm doing and, and praise the things that are going right so that I know I'm going that way and, and help me understand the things that are not so that I can continue to move the right way. That's important. So, I, so a, a place that I can give myself exposure to allow my own growth. And if you're an instructor, especially a school owner, you understand this challenge. When you work towards the top of the list, you have less people to do that for you. So this is my way of looking outside of that. I've got my instructors. I've got people that can do that. But I want to expand that network and really have people help me grow. And sometimes that's going to be through criticism of me going the wrong way. And I'm good with it. Let's do it. And then last is that comfort. 
I want to gain that comfort of, of knowing that I can send students, building relationships with people that I can send students to if they're moving to that area. At the end of the day, I have my goals for where I'm going, but something really important to me is what I'm providing to my students. And so this is allowing me to do that. There are ways to have rank recognized. There are ways to have it as part of that. So, so it will help with that. Now, again, I fully believe that whatever school they go to should have the ability to decide how they manage that. I've already kind of described how I manage it and I expect people to do stuff like that. Or they could not, they could be like, Hey, you know, and maybe they, at that point, they'll know through the exposure part, they'll know, I know who that guy is. I know what's going on. I know what he's like. I'm happy to, to respect your rank because I know where it came from now. And cool. So those are things that are really good that I think have potential. It won't always be exactly as you picture it, and that's okay too. But joining this organization, in my opinion, the why I did it is because it is it's building the framework that matches what I'm trying to do. And I'm watching people like Andy Allen and Chris Hansen and Ian Abernathy and Les Bookka and all these different people who are heading the way that I want to go and the, the direction that I am going. And I'm already building great relationships with these people. And I know some of them, like Andy Allen, I, he just recently joined, or, or I think recently joined, or at least I'm late to the game as far as watching the videos of him doing that. Um, and I'm so excited to see how it's building and what's going on. And, I, and I'm trying to restructure my own curriculum to match where I'm going. And, and having access to people who are doing the same thing or have done the same thing is huge. So I think this is going to be really, really great. And if you haven't looked at the World Combat Association, I'll have links down below. I hope that you do. And I also am totally fine if you don't want to be involved with it or you do something else or you're happy with your organization. I'm not telling you what to do. But I am telling you that it exists so that it's on your radar. And if it's interesting, you should look at it. One of the biggest things I got out of all of this that you've heard over and over in this video is I got to be aware of things that I wasn't aware of. So I'm hoping that I'm making you aware of things that maybe you weren't aware of. That's the goal. That's a big part of this channel anyway. So that's it. If you're going through these things and you don't know what to do, feel free to reach out. If you're going through these things and you do know what to do or you've got some advice, hit it in the comments or, or hit me up in a message or email me or whatever. You know, let's get connected. Let's build these relationships. I really want to see that happen. In the meantime, if you like this, you want to see this path go on, if you want to watch what's happening, subscribe over here and I'll throw some videos like these right here and a couple videos that you might like right here. And otherwise I'm just going to catch you in the next one.